Holly, you're the kind of friend, though, so uh, we're going to be talking about asking a lot of questions. We all need friends in our lives where maybe, uh, maybe we like, aren't necessarily allowed to sit next to at a serious function. And I think that that's probably oh, you. 100%. How many of you guys have a friend like that? Like, you shouldn't be allowed to sit next to at a serious function. How many of y'all are that friend? Like, you're like, it's actually me. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. okay. That's him. We talked about that this morning. Hand up. Yes. Yeah. I know. It's <laughs> yes. We did. We did. Because he listed off about four people. And I said, honey, you can list so many because it, that's you. You, you separate you draw those. Pastor Brandon and I every executive staff meeting. I She's do. Like, you two need to separate now, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, we have a lot of fun. Yeah. I do. I do. So the questions that you all asked, they honestly, they kept circling back around to how do I? Mm-hmm. How do I? How do I grow in relationships? How do I do this well? What do I do after this season? What does this look like? And Pastor Daniel said it, but one One thing that we work really hard in this series with you all is that you can walk away feeling, can walk away feeling encouraged with something in this series. And all of the questions, they were amazingly all, well, how about this? How about that? And the thing that when we prayed about this particular week, this week we really felt like was going to be about fighting for progress in relationships. Well, everybody do like this. Put it up like this, Sam. We're going to fight for progress. We're going to fight for it. Look at the person next to you and say, we're going to fight for progress. Come on. And fight for progress. I play guitar. I started in music a long, long time ago. And uh, if I picked up a guitar, Raina had her guitar over here. And if I was trying to get it back in tune, I wouldn't just start cranking all of the tuning knobs. No, that's, that's crazy. If you're a musician, you're like, whoa, whoa. No, it's little tweaks. And part of fighting for progress is little tweaks every day. If we can just do a couple little tweaks every day to realign our lives our hearts and stay connected to the vine. We're gonna fight for progress and get better every day. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Write this one down in your notes today or take a picture of it when it's up on the screen. It says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So these little tweaks and these little shifts are so important. So as we're talking about fighting for progress, Holly has been in ministry over 35 years, married for over 40, right? 38. Almost 40. I did did some recon, 38 years. Yes, he did the math. Phenomenal. Make some noise for that. Almost 40 years. 38 years. He's driving me crazy today, but most days I like him. Yeah. So she's... She's my favorite because in our No Filters series, she doesn't have a filter. Okay. There's not one. Good. So she will be very honest, and it's the best because it's the most challenging, <laughs> and I love it. Um, the first thing we want to talk about, though, is about that accountability factor. So accountability in relationships and in life. I feel like it's a conversation we talk about in church, um, but I feel like sometimes accountability works, and I feel like sometimes accountability doesn't work. Mm. So talk about that. Let me just back up just a little bit. Please. <clears throat> And that what's great about this series is that, you know, Christianity is a communal faith, and it's about together. And it's never just supposed to be you and God. In fact, if it was only going to be you and God, then Adam would have had a good time in the garden by himself. But it was never just about Adam and the Father. And so it was, you know, Adam and Eve then, so it was community. And so that's that's the goal, right, is for us to have true, genuine community with one another. And the last prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17, he prayed that we would be one. And I think that's been our, and and when he prayed that, he started that, he said, I'm not actually praying for the world right now. I'm praying for my followers that they would be one. So we have this big hope to change the world, but we are, we are not that great at loving each other. (laughs) Right. And even in, you know, today's culture and church culture, we're so divided about the most random, stupid things. Right. And so he's praying that we would be one. Right? That's the goal. And that's so much easier to put on a t-shirt or on the front of a journal <laughs> than it is, or to call a series that, than it is to actually do it. So that's why I appreciate some of these questions, because so this is some of the practical tools about how do we do that then? So if that's his prayer, and I think it's his last prayer, we should pay attention, right? Nope, that's great. So how do we actually then walk as one? Yeah. So good. So we're going to talk about accountability. The Bible says this in Proverbs 12, verse 15, and We love the way the Amplified reads. It says, the way of the arrogant fool, we're like, oh, that started pretty strong, who rejects God's wisdom is right in his own eyes. But a wise and prudent man or woman is he who listens to counsel. 
We talk all the time that you should have somebody pouring into you. You should be pouring into someone else. You should have brothers and sisters standing next to you. Accountability almost has become a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a dirty word, but accountability actually cultivates responsibility because then you're transparent, you're honest, causes you to approach integrity and character differently. So we're gonna talk about this. What does accountability look like? Well, uh, I think it's become a little bit of the word to use. Because like if they had accountability in their life, they wouldn't have made that decision. So then it's only used in that context. But I yeah. think it's actually much broader than that. I think as people of faith, we should be humble enough to acknowledge our need for one another. And so, because I can only see my life from my point of view. I can only see it this direction. I can't see, like even in a practical sense, I can't see behind me. I can't see if there's something in the back of my head. I can't see it. And so I actually need you to do that. I need you to see that. That's good. And so I think that's, that's the posture, is if we come into any relationship, or honestly any situation, any job, with just a smidge of humility, say, like, I need help to help me see the bigger picture. And so for us, like even in, in like practical ways, we, as a church culture, we would do a run-through. Uh, I would do a run-through of my message that I was going to give on Sunday because I didn't want the first service to be my run-through service. Right? So we would do a, a big thank you. Yeah. So we, we would do a run-through during the week. And in that run-through, I'm doing, a, and again, it's just giving the basic thoughts of a message, but I'm, I'm submitting it to the team to go, what am I forgetting? What am I not seeing? And so it's like that's where it's the help. And then even recently I was speaking in Indonesia, and obviously I have a translator there, and so I do the first service with him, and then I go into the green room afterwards, and I said to him, okay, what, do you, what would you change about this message? Help me, because I can only see it from my Western culture eyes. That's good. So what do I need to change here? And so he goes, and he was first taken aback that I would ask which I, how sad is that? That that's just, a, that's just a normal, right? And so then he goes, well, actually, since you're asking, um, we should probably do away with that opening story. It doesn't make sense here. And maybe go straight to this point. I'm like, perfect. Wow. So we did it. But to me, that's, what, that's accountability. It's, so whoever the, uh, example, so whoever the team up here leading worship is like amazing. But you better be asking people, did it actually resonate with people? Yeah, that's good. You're up here having yourself quite a time. But... No, that's did, great. Did they feel, so that's what I'm talking about, just the humility yeah. with anything that you're trusted with. And so whether it's in a friendship or a marriage or even with your children, it's like having the humility to say, when I said that, did that what did that sound like to you? Yeah. Or is there a better way so to do this? The, the truth is, you hear the word, though, the, the sticky statement is humility. Because blind spots, we've talked about this, are blind spots for a reason. You can't see them. So to have somebody and trust somebody, I asked my Bible study, it's a bunch of dudes, I said, who's in your life that can check you so you don't wreck yourself? Like who with grace and truth can actually say something to you and you're not gonna get all offended and puffed Let up? Let me white. just push that back a little bit right. because it's not just, okay, so for example, you've invited me and excuse me, we're having a little family conversation. Yes. You've invited me into like the family to today. Sure. So, but it's not up to me to right. say, Jackie, you should do this differently. It's your job to come to me and say, what would you do differently? Yeah. yeah. So it's not my job to check you. That's so good. It's your job to come and say, so what would you do? That's yes. great. So that's the different perspective. Oh, it's to ask, it's to, that's why sometimes we think, like even that, to me it's an old school, the phrase covering. I mean, that's yeah. not even in the Bible. Mm. It's submit yourselves to one another. So good. So it's you come in yeah. and then there's protection. And then there's hum because and, of humility. Right. Yeah. Right. That really does define humility, though, is that one little tweak. Yeah. Because I think it's really easy to get stuck on the humble heart aspect and say, I have a very humble heart. So, Lord, bring <laughs> all the things to me. Yes. But yes. when are we really willing to pursue it ourselves? Because the word is very clear about the importance of pursuit. I mean, everything that, that the Lord established as a pattern was truly about pursuit. He pursues us. And he, in turn, wants us to pursue him. But he also wants us to pursue relationships. And in pursuing relationships, we also have to be willing to pursue health within ourselves. I love that. That we have to reach out and say, okay, 
how am I doing? Yeah. Or, or humble yourself enough to confess your sins. Yeah. I just confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it's coming saying, I'm so sorry uh, for this behavior. I'm sorry. And don't ever say I'm sorry, but ever. Take that out of your good. Right. Write that down. So it's I'm sorry. No, but. For. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you did this. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry for doing this. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry. And don't say, here's my other one. I, it's so annoying. People mm -hmm. say, I'm sorry that hurt you. Mm. Yes. No, I'm sorry I hurt you. Yeah. Right? Don't just. I think we're all guilty of that, right? A little bit. Nine of you. Okay, cool. Like, <laughs> that's ownership. That's good. That is... Because that's part of that humility. That's that, you know, again, the accountability is like, I'm sorry. Just recognizing that. So what's the second part, though, then as a follow-up to that? Her response in Indonesia in that story. Did anybody else notice her response when the pastor said, oh, actually, let's fix this and check this? And she said, okay, yeah, no problem. Uh -huh. Anybody ever had a response that wasn't like that when somebody said, you should do something different? I see one hand back there, one honest person. Two, three, four, five, six. Like an auction. I got five. I'm going to seven, eight, 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 <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, you know, the Bible says our our way is right in our own head. Right. Right. So whatever we've done, yes. whether we've at our job, we've done a paper at our school, we've you know done, done something, and so we think it's right. So when someone else comes and offers a different perspective, we get defensive. That's our first. And I, I mean, I'm only saying this because that used to be me until I really got this revelation that if I'm ever actually going to reflect the character and nature of Jesus, I have to be one with you. So good. And you see things differently than I do. And we're both good with that. We have to be good with that. Yeah. So good. Right. So good. Which brings us really to our second question. I know it was the question that, that you wanted to ask her specifically. So we're both babies. If you talk about like birth order, um, a firstborn, typically, uh, how many all are firstborns? Wait a minute, okay. You, perfe you perfectionist. Ooh, all the firstborns. You we need you. We need you. We do. <laughs> And you guys are the babies, is that what you said? We're You're both the babies. babies. We break and technically, rules. if you're like reading books well, on... I wasn't going to call on, you a baby, but okay. <laughs> but if you're reading books on birth order, who shouldn't marry each other? Babies, typically, but because we always have fun all the time. Anyways, but personality differences. So the Bible says this in Philippians chapter 2. If you're new to the Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. <laughs> it says, let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others. So here's the question. How do we value personality differences in relationships opposed to clashing with them? Okay, I love this. Yeah. Right? And then Paul even painted a picture talking about the body. It's like, how would the mouth say, you know, yeah. I don't need the arm it's because we all need each other. He never referenced the pinky toe, though. Yeah. It's awkward. We don't know why we have them. Keep going. Until you break it, and I've broken it so many it's times. It's the worst. Yes, it's the worst. And then you know that you have one. Yes. Okay, keep going. Yes. Um, well, that's what makes the being one a, a challenge is mm -hmm. because we're different. I mean, people are weird. Yeah. Right. People are weird. I mean, that's not you. should clap. No, it's person, true. But the person behind you is so strange. <laughs> <laughs> and so we let our differences, rather than bring strength to us or to our team or to our family, we let the differences separate us. And there are so many differences that are are evident, right? There's the different personalities. There's the extroverts, the introverts, the talks a lot, the hardly ever talks, the I need my time and space. And then, you know, are you, do, are you Enneagram people? I'm a seven wing eight. Yeah, me too. So, right. And, and then there's us and we're obnoxious to sometimes the yes. people who just want their ducks in a row. So like I, my husband is a ducks in a row guy and I'm kicking over the ducks because I didn't even see there were ducks, right? <laughs> I mean, like his... Like, whang, just kicking it, yeah. <laughs> when we first got married, it was um, like he, his closet was a work of art. Like there was the short sleeve shirts color coded and then it slowly graduated to like the, you know, long sleeve shirts and then, then you know, like suits back when he wore suits and they were all like there. And, the, and my style of closet management was if I kicked my shoe off and it hit the door, I called it in. <laughs> right? So when? you can see why I would be an irritation to him. If he hit the door. So, but, so we had to do some work, right? Because if we spent a lot of time trying to change each other. Um, and then we went, oh, actually, he didn't, he didn't, he married me because of who I am. I married him because of who he is. And then we waste so much time trying to change the, the person from whom we married. Anyway, and so we, you, you eventually just have to realize that there is a strength, um, it, that, that's there and there is a strength in here and working together is way more powerful. But it works in friendships as well. 
And so oftentimes we find ourselves drawn to people who are just like us, and that's a problem. I mean, it's good, but it's also a problem because then there's nobody to say, have you considered another way to do this? Yeah. Right? If, you just, if you're just like, living in an echo chamber, it's a really dangerous way to live. Yeah. Right? Without someone with a different perspective. So the different personalities, inviting them to, into your life, is, uh, that's another aspect of humility. It's like, I need that person who's mellow, and calm. I love that. And so that's the, that, th- there's a very dear friend of mine, and that's who she is. And when I'm panicked and afraid, that's who I call. That's amazing. Right? And I, I think I would have overlooked her initially to my detriment. And so I just think we have to do the work of not rejecting someone because they're too something, too loud, too quiet, too whatever that would be for you. Because God doesn't reject them. Yeah. Right? That's and, so then, good. and then we separate ourselves because of either cultural or ethnic differences. And um, that's why I love just even looking out at this church. It's very, you know, very familiar to me. I was raised out of this country. So, and then our, the church we pastored in LA that was... Uh, incredibly diverse. And so it's very comfortable for me. But let me just tell you, sitting next to someone doesn't make a relationship. So good. Right, you can sit next to someone and watch the Astros play. Right. But that doesn't make a relationship. A relationship is having dinner with someone. A relationship is sharing things with someone. And sometimes that's hard, right? Because where we might be culturally different. Y también tengo amigos aquí que hablan español. Ah! Bienvenidos a la casa de Dios. Somos amigos por siempre. Sorry about the rest of you guys. <laughs> but basically, I'm Love going to it. lunch with them. So, yes. <laughs> but but it's just it's it's that's the important thing. Is just like so. Where are you intentionally seeking out someone who's not like you? That's so good. If your dinner table or your friendship circle looks like you, you're going to be in shock in heaven. Seriously. That's so good. So it's like, so where we let differences separate us, I think, is an affront to the mandate of heaven. And so I just, and then, sorry, then I'll shut up after this, but. Oh, this is great. But also where we get separated from each other is just the the generational differences. Right? So in this room, there are people, the, you know, the boomers and the millennials and the Xers and the Zers and the Y. It's just like, there's all of us in this room. And if you're, again, if your friendship circle just includes the people who were born in your 20 years or 50, then you're missing it, yeah. right? We, you have to intentionally, and, and listen, it's just like you're, you get irritated, right? So if you're older, you go, good Lord, does it have to be so loud? <laughs> Which is what I told him. It's like, are you hard of hearing? Anyway, and so, or then if you're you know, younger, then you look at that older person and go, um, can you speed it up here a little bit? But then you're missing the gold that would come from each. You're That's missing great. what each would bring to the table. And so I just think that the, the differences is not just personality, and because, but those are the obvious ones. But there's a lot of differences that we have to overcome. That's so good. Come on, I think we just give God praise for just that whole. And if you're an extrovert, make some noise. Come on. And if you're an introvert, make some noise. Look at you. You're growing. The introverts just amazing. Just snap. I yeah, that was, was going to say, <laughs> give them something else. I'm proud of them. That was huge. Okay. I love it. That was so good. So good. We teach our kids because we have four. So we obviously have a firstborn and a secondborn. Any parents out there say you understand the difference between a firstborn kid and a secondborn kid? And our secondborn, yes. Finley, turned 13 yesterday. Y'all, I had a tough time. I had a tough time as a dad. So sweet. I told her, I said, hey, I filed with the state of Texas. They said you're going to stay 12. She was like, you can do that? I was like, it's already done. She's so sweet. She was like, okay, that's yeah, fine. No big deal. But she's actually quite outgoing. She's, you know, the one that will fight fight for you in the parking lot. So if yeah, anybody's yeah. being harmed. Heat. We call her the heat. She's, she's jumping out and going she after her arm wrestling. Yeah. But we always teach our kids because um, firstborn one and secondborn two, boy, girl, they butt heads. 
They butt heads because they see the world entirely differently, entirely differently. Um, our oldest, he's very strategic in his thinking. Everything has order. Our second, I mean, you couldn't have described our first and second better. If there is something that Finley could pick up, I'm, I'm praising her all day long. I, I let Brecken eat in my vehicles because he's, he keeps it all tidy. Right. Finley will make something that has no ability to crumble and fall apart just be everywhere yes. in my Jeep. She does. So I'm like, I'm going to have to call an Uber for you because you can't, you can't eat that in my truck. She's amazing. They're both amazing. But the thing that we teach them all the time is what you just said, is that you want someone in your life that looks at life differently. You want somebody in your Beautiful world thing. that sees it differently oh. because the area that you're strong in, you're going to come to the end of that strength at some point. And you want somebody with a different gifting and That's a good. different strength set to be able to fill in those, those gaps. And it's just, it's much easier said than done. So I'm just yeah. giving us permission to recognize that. I mean, yeah. the Bible, Proverbs says that iron sharpens iron. Yep. Right? It's not marshmallow bumping into marshmallow. <laughs> right? It's iron. But sparks and... Sparks and flames. Yeah. And, but we need that. It's just we hate it. It's true. I mean, unless... I mean, she's the Christian. So maybe she <laughs> doesn't hate it. Every marriage should have one. And uh, I'm pretty sure I got this one sorted out. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Can we thank Holly for her last time at Hope City ever? Just really appreciate that. So far, so good. Okay. Wait, one last thing that you commented on there, which I think is so good, aside from that part. I'll, you two talk about that later. But I think one thing that she said that's so important is generationally. We have to yes. be willing, and I think it goes back to the first thing that you said. We have to be willing to position generations in front of us and generations behind us. But we have to be the ones that do it. Now, I was so blessed that Holly reached to me and positioned herself in my life. And that was a gifting for me. I have a biological mama. I have a wonderful mother in love as well. Um, but I also need spiritual mamas. And we all need that. But how many of us are looking for it? Or how many of us are, are moving the next generation out of the way and saying, let's do it ourselves? It's, it's easy to just quickly dismiss it. Um, if I ever throw back and do a hymn, it's shocking how many of our younger generation here at the church will say, that's an amazing song. Did you write that? And I say, yes, I did. Um, <laughs> how great thou art. Yeah, anyways. But it, it, it also pricks the hearts of our older generation. Our median age is younger at this church. But we want to challenge you specifically this weekend. Make sure you're seeking out those relationships. Ask those that have gone before you to speak into your life, give you wisdom and clarity. There's a gentleman sitting on the second row over here. Him and I talk all the time, and I'm grateful. He's, he asked me one day, he was like, what do you want from me? I said, I don't want anything from you. I just want to be around you. Because I could see that he has business and leadership skills, and every time I'm around him, I grow a little bit more and grow a little bit more. And I feel like I leave with a deposit every single time. But if we're not looking for that... Well, it's actually in the Bible, too. So Titus chapter two challenges, yes. says older, on my paraphrase, older man, your job is the younger man and older woman, your job is the younger woman. And I remember thinking, well, great. When I get to be 118, then I'll be <laughs> like the old woman and then I'll help all those people. But when I, I was about 35 or something, when I just jumped out at me and God said to me, um, Holly, is there anybody younger than you on the planet right now? Yes. He goes, well, then she's yours. So that shaped me from an early age. So if you're in here and you are, you know, 70, then yeah, you got a lot of us. And if you're in here and you're 17, you're an old man. You're an old woman because there's kids in a nursery who one day will look to you. Oh, that's cool. That's and really so good. Your, your job is always, just as he said in any season, is to have somebody older and somebody younger that's doing life with you. And when, when, when you're in older person mode, like my job, because, you know, Jackie was a part of this mentorship group. And so my job with her as the younger is to open my life and tell her mistakes I made, be honest and real about mistakes I've made so that she won't have to make them. So I used good. to open my life to that. Right. And then her job as the younger is to shut up. <laughs> Right, and so sometimes we have like the younger ones and they just come into a room filled with wisdom and they don't shut up. It's so like good. if you're the young person in a room, shh, shh, ask 
questions. Like, how would you do I love this? that. What would you do here? Yeah. Right? And so we have different responses. Now, not that you can't ever say anything, but you get my point. So it's like, I've been in environments with, and there's like people who've been leading in churches for five minutes, and then they step, in, and listen, I can, I'm going to learn from everybody. That's the posture I'm going to have. But they step into, you know, conversation with me, and I, they don't ask one question. I'm like, okay, you got this. You go ahead on then with your bad self. But I'm just thinking, so when you're in young person mode, maybe you should, like, what, what are the great questions to ask this person? Is it about business? Is it about family? Yes. Is it about church? What is it that you can ask? Because it's not, it's, it's not a weakness right. to put yourself in a position to grow, but you have to put yourself in that position. When we first started in ministry, we're in this room. We were invited to this dinner. I mean, our, they had our name, like, tags on the dinner. I was like, whoa, we've arrived and I'm looking around the room and everybody who is 25, 30, 35 years in ministry and we were brand new. And I remember they're talking about uh, Reinhard Bonnke, two million souls saved and all these incredible things that God had done. And I was like waiting for the opportunity to jump in and be like, I did a, I did a, I led worship at a youth camp. They paid me in barbecue. Like it was a lot of fun. And they're looking at me like, how'd this guy get in the room? And I was so trying to be seen. I was so trying to be heard. I was so trying to network and jockey and be somebody. And there was a sweet lady. Um, I, I don't know how old she would have been at the time. She was anywhere between 50 and 120. But she was, she had been doing this a long time. And she said, she said this to me. She was like, come here. And I walked to her, I said, yes, ma'am. And she was like, is this your wife? And she said, oh, you're so poised and wise. And anointed, and I'm, I'm like, she's just like, just gloating on her, and she's like, and, and you, um, you talk a lot, you do, you say a lot of things, and, and this is what she said, she said, you're supposed to be in this room, and I said, thank you, and she said, no, I mean, literally, your name was at, at your seat, that's phenomenal, you're supposed to be in this room, but what you didn't recognize is your seat at the table, she said, the season you're in is to listen, to grow, to be a sponge and soak up. Yeah. It's true. It's true. And you know what's wild? She said, one day as you grow, um, they'll say, hey, what do you think? And one day you'll be leading this table. We sat back in that room year after year after year and just listened. We just shut up. We just listened. Three years in, one of the guys leaned up and said, Daniel, Jackie, you guys have been doing this and you've been traveling, doing music. And stuff. Can you tell me what you've been seeing? And I felt the Holy Spirit say, your position at the table just changed. And then three years after that, we were leading the table. So that's a good word for somebody. What is your season? Recognize your seat at the table right now. If the only information and everything and all your accolades are coming through TikTok and people that are gassing you up and your circle is only telling you how great you are and you don't have somebody in your life saying, hey, 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 let me help you. One thing about y'all's relationship, you said it, learn from my mistakes. You could just compartmentalize them and act like everything's been perfect. But instead you've said, hey, don't, don't do this. Like, don't fall into my patterns. And then in that, you were able to listen. Yeah. It's amazing. All right, we gotta move on to another question. This is phenomenal. Y'all getting something out of this? Woo-woo. I am. I'm, in, I'm liking this. Well, you know, when, when Jesus challenged us to love our neighbor as ourself, and the really sad thing is I think we do because I don't think we love ourselves. So we're not great at loving who we are, at being confident, you know, the God confidence in who I am, so then I can't actually freely love other people yeah. because my insecurity will come out and, and bring damage to a relationship. So I just think, honestly, wow. before we can get great at loving anyone, we have to be, have the confidence that we are who God says we are. So good. Right? That I'm loved for who I am. Yeah. And nobody can take that away. And so then my love for other people just comes out of an overflow. I don't need anything from you in the sense that I don't need you to fill a hole in me. I can give to you, yeah. right? So it comes out of that. That's so, so good. good. That's so good. You said a few minutes ago um, in response to something, and, and be free to know that this isn't easy. Um, and in that, in relationships, there's, there's often pain that comes with them, right? 
there are so often these residual hurts that we have from relationships, which can leave us feeling fearful the next time we enter into a relationship. That triggers. Mm -hmm. Or in the next season of that relationship. So tell us a little bit about how we can navigate fear in relationships. How to do that. Let me read a verse while you're thinking it. Psalms 34, 4. I sought the Lord. He answered me. And I love this last line. And he delivered me from all of my fears. I told my oldest son yesterday, he was worked, over, worked up over something and he was kind of afraid about something. And I said, and I started telling him all these stats and I said, buddy, I love the acronym of fear. It's false evidence appearing real. And a lot of times when you allow that fear to take root, it becomes, even a weed starts as a seed and it will begin to produce something that's actually not good fruit because it's false evidence appearing real. So how do we navigate that, especially with triggers and all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, relationships, they're risky. They're risky because to have a genuine, intimate relationship with someone, I mean, rewind. Like We can all have those Facebook friends or the Instagram friends, but they're not your friends. Right. Right. You're not calling them at five o'clock to come pick you up at an airport. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're not your friends. So real friends come from intimacy. And it's risky to be really intimate with someone. I mean, sharing your heart and soul because once they know you, they have more ammunition. Right. And potentially, they'll betray you. Anybody in the room ever been betrayed by a friend? <clears throat> well, we're in good company because so is Jesus, right? right. So yeah. this doesn't... But here's your option, is to just live a walled-off life, separated from people then. And I don't know how you're going to answer God for that, right? Because his prayer still is that we would be one. And being one with people means I have to let some walls down and let you in, and I have to be vulnerable. Now, I've also learned in the lot of years of doing life that I don't just share my whole life with everybody immediately, right? Right. You let someone prove faithful with a little, right? And then you offer more. Right. So I've gotten a little wiser with how I open my heart to someone. Yeah. But still, there's a risk to it. But do you know what? There's a risk living on planet Earth too. So it's just life, <laughs> right? And, and discernment comes into play. Well, with people. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But we, we still have to be careful that we don't get into such... Like, I know... Listen, I understand boundaries. I've taught them. I've read the books. Yes, healthy boundaries. But what I've seen, this, the newer trend, is that people aren't setting boundaries. They're building walls yeah. Yeah. and calling it a boundary. That's good. And that's a problem, yeah. right? So just, yes, people can hurt you. Yes, that's going to happen. Sorry about that. It will. But it doesn't mean you don't open your heart again to someone else. Right. Because what is your option to become hard and bitter? And there, there was a season in our life, there was a really horrible season, which, you know, I'll share in a message one day here. But it was a horrible season. At the end of that season, I was not just, I didn't have just a root of bitterness. I had a whole flame and tree growing inside my soul. And it, the betrayal was the final, like, nail in the coffin of it for me. It's just like somebody who... I'd done a lot of life with, shared a lot of things with, and absolutely betrayed. And I had a a decision to make in that moment. And in that moment, actually, I remember sitting on my couch like this, and I was so mad. And I didn't really want to see people, and I'm people-y. Like, I like people. If you come next to me, I'm touching you. It's just, that's how I am. It's borderline assault. You hit me when you walked in today. Exactly. I'm touchy. I'm touchy. Yeah. Uh. (laughs) And so for me to be that isolated was like not a good thing. And um, it was not me. And I, God showed me a picture of who that woman sitting on the couch would become. Just wow. like this bitter, angry old woman. Alone. And I didn't want to be her. Right? So I had to make some decisions then. And there were some things I did. And the first thing I did actually was make this decision about Gratitude. Like finding something to be grateful for. That's great. Until it broke in me. And, you know, gratitude is not a feeling, it's a choice, right? And so, till that thing broke. And so then I had to open my heart up again to 
somebody else once again, and there's like the, you know, I know all the feelings, but you do it again because that's who we are, right? And we're not going to be these hard, cold people, not the family of God. If we're going to impact the world like God's asking us to impact it, it's not gonna, we're not going to impact it by being so stiff. No, have soft-hearted, soft-hearted toward people. Another interesting thought, and I'm still working this out, so you guys can wrestle with this later and edit it out of the message, but... Um, like we might have to edit it out? Yeah, anyway. Okay. I'm, I'm not cussing, though. Okay, good. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Front row saying, oh, <laughs> oh, come on, just a little bit? Okay, this is ridiculous. Most interesting thing. So I can't find in the Bible where it says we're to trust people. It says we trust God and we love people. Yes. yes. We love people. Yes. And so then we have, sometimes we have to, we trust God when we've been through a betrayal and a heartbreak. We say, I trust you that you're going to see me through this and that you started this work in me and you'll finish it and you'll give me the ability to love again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we trust God so that we can love people. That's so good. That's so good. I love that because it reminds me of Psalm 37, verse 5. We wanted to ask you about, about bitterness anyways, but I love it because this scripture, it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. God will act because the relationships that we have are not meant to be, you guys have heard us say this over and over and over again, they are not meant to be the thing that fulfills you. They are meant to be the thing that is a bonus. Our relationship with the Lord is the fulfiller in relationship. So every time we have a, a beneficial or harmful moment in relationship, we take it to God, and it should strengthen your relationship with him. It should strengthen your trust in him, your conversations with God. We, we had, and this is, I had a pastor friend call, and he said, hey, as you guys are navigating the journey of ministry, you have to stay thick-skinned, because there are people, some of y'all, if I ask you, show of hands, um, sometimes we end up getting overwhelmed by the people who are committed to misunderstanding you. And it feels like they're nonstop. So you love the memes that say like a shake will a snake will shed its skin, but it's still a snake. Don't trust people. And you're like, hey man, I'll repost that. <laughs> but the flip side is this. Here's the flip side. One person was like, that's a whole word. I'm putting that on my Instagram. <laughs> Here's the truth though. You've never looked in the eyes of anyone that God doesn't love. And so, yeah, you might have been hurt, and you do have to guard your heart. But make sure that you are, are constantly redirecting those, those broken moments to the Lord and saying, but God, I want to still be able to trust again. Because yeah. this was the question that she was going to ask. How do we get better so that we don't stay bitter? Yeah. Well, I think you said it right there, right? It's a, it is a choice. And it, it, I think we all have to be honest because... Uh, I, mean, I mean, honestly, COVID, I mean, I know you guys cured it here in Texas, but we really dealt with it in <laughs> California a lot. And, um, but we just opted out. Yeah, you I opted think the out. state of Texas just opted out of spectacular, it. Spectacular, actually. Um, but it was a great revealer, right? I think it was the revealer in a lot of ways uh, where people were in their hearts and souls. And so I just think even being honest about where you've grown a little cynical or bitter. Right, about people or about whether it's certain segments of people or popular theory, family. I don't know what it would be. But just being honest, it, to me, is the first step. Is going, actually, I do have a little bit of an edge toward those people, toward that person. And that's step one. It's like being honest about it. Because you can't take, deal with something that you're not talking about. So I think that's step one. Ooh, and then it's, I think gratitude is, you know, Paul tells us, challenges us that in all things give thanks in all things yeah. love that not necessarily for them but just in them in the middle for this is God's will for you so good so if you want to know what God's will is be thankful and to me that was the the, the trigger that broke the the bitter nonsense going on inside my heart so yeah. okay. okay last question we want to leave you with and it's a broad one but I know that you have a wonderful answer for it because I trust you um the I think we have these ideas of what peace-filled, healthy relationships look like. And so sometimes we panic when they don't look just like that. So what would you describe peace 
What does it look like in relationships? Just a peace-filled relationship. What does that look like? Because each of us, it's different, but at the root of it, you know, the, the Lord says in the word to seek peace and pursue it. So what does peace really look like in relationships with people that differ from us, with people that are similar to us in single seasons, married seasons? What does peace look like? Um, that's a good question because I think you're right. I think we have this really hallmark version of peace, uh, of what a relationship, sort of the romantic relationship. But it's more like a lifetime movie. Yeah, whatever that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just think it's, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, yeah. not the peacekeepers. So good. And making peace often involves conflict, mm. right? So unity and peace often come on the other side of conflict. Because you probably know people. I mean, maybe it was your family of origin, but that there was, the home was quiet, but there was no peace there. Mm. There just was no arguing. And so it was all kind of under the rug. And if you were in a real spiritual home, it was under the blood rug, right? So let's, we're not going to talk about stuff. We're not going to deal with stuff. We're just going to sweep it under the rug. And, and we call that peace, and that's not peace, right? And so sometimes the best seasons of peace with my friends come on the other side of an argument where we're listening to each other, but we're pushing through to get unity because the goal is unity. The goal is not to get my way. The goal is unity. And that sometimes the best seasons of my marriage have come through when we push through conflict. Yeah. Right? It's just because two becoming one, man, that's only easy in movies. Yeah. And the reality, it is not that. Right? And so real unity and real peace oftentimes comes on the other side of conflict. However, the pastor in me is going to say, you can't live in conflict. Right? And... And also, I think what's been really helpful for me with what, dealing with my children who are now you know, adults and my husband and even some people is I had a counselor I went to because that's an outside perspective saying, Holly, why don't you think about it this way? Or it's just helpful sometimes to have somebody else's perspective as you're on this journey towards peace. And, and I love that you said, so she has her master's degree in counseling. Like she's brilliant. Uh, not a therapist, but carries her you know, master's degree in that and studied it and then applies it through a pastoral covering. But uh, I grew up in a very word of faith sort of atmosphere where if you said counseling, it's like, oh, so you're real messed up. Oh, so you like you obviously are weak in faith. And that's not true at all. No, and, and, I, and I, I feel like we need to apologize for a little bit of that mm -hmm. culture because I understand that, that that was like the attitude around it. And it was just wrong. We need help. We need help. We're all pretty flawed, broken human beings, yes. right? And we need help. And sometimes you just need someone who's got a little more training than you in an area to come alongside. That's that humble yourself. So good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Holly, would you just pray for us? Would you, would you pray for honor. the room, for our family, for our family watching online? Yes. Amen. Just yeah. a prayer blessing. Yeah. Is everybody okay first? Is everybody good? You okay? Okay. Is this okay? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't offend anybody yet? Okay. Father, I'm so grateful to be in your house today and in this house. And I pray, God, I just pray over every person watching. I pray over every man and woman in this room. And I know, God, that your plan is that we would walk as one, that we would walk in genuine relationship, that we would be, recognize our need for one another, that we would truly go stronger together. Forgive us, God, where we might have isolated ourselves or separated ourselves from one another. But today we make a decision to just make another step, make another step of progress in connecting and build, doing life and building genuine relationships with each other. And I just bless this room in Jesus' name. I bless these people in the name of Jesus. I thank you that they sense your favor and your peace today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can Amen. we honor Miss Holly Wagner for bringing the word today? It was so good. Love it, love it, love it. If y'all would just remain standing for just a moment. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna step into this moment because here's the reality. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here or you're watching online and you would say, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. If everybody would just stay where they're at just for a moment. This is the most 
important moment because we turn a gymnasium into a sanctuary to give people an opportunity to walk with the Lord. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. With every eye closed, just for a moment, maybe the second invitation, you would say, I walked with the Lord before, but I fell away. I've experienced trauma in my life. Maybe you have gotten mad at God and you turned away and you got caught up in the prodigal life, but something today stirred in you that it's time to come back home. We say this often here at Hope City that Jesus is just one mention of his name away from being right there again as your refuge and your strength. So whether you're the first invitation, you wanna give your life to the Lord for the first time or the second invitation and you wanna rededicate your life, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to just boldly say, you're talking about me and slip up your hand across every campus. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. One, today I wanna give my life to the Lord. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I see you. Amazing, I see you and you and you and you and you. I see you right here, my friend. I see you, come on. Incredible, I saw you right here. It's incredible. Let's go, all right, let's pray. Say this together, all of us together, whether you lifted your hand or not, I saw you in the back as well. Say this out loud, Jesus, today I'm making a choice and I'm approaching you with humility, asking for forgiveness for all my sins. Here's my shame. It was on my struggles. I lay it at your feet. Jesus, thank you for hanging out with me in my low seasons and lifting me up through the price you paid on the cross that day. From this moment on, I choose you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City, can we make some noise for everybody who just said yes to Jesus today?